What's going on, everyone? This is Matt Dinnerman, the track announcer at Emerald Downs. Thank you for tuning in and listening to our special Washington Cup Stakes podcast. This right here, we'll be analyzing the six Washington Cup Stakes races on Sunday, August 27th. Races four through nine is the sequence for all the stakes races. Race number four, which is the Washington Cup Juvenile Phillies, begins the all stakes pick four. It should be a lot of fun this Sunday. Not only do we have six stakes races for you, but we also have the beer festival down at the park area on track level. That's level two. So, Hey, who doesn't like great beer and great horse racing on a beautiful Sunday afternoon? And coming into Sunday, it looks like it's going to be a really fun day of racing, a good card, a fun atmosphere as always here at Emerald Downs, and we're going to get right to it, talking about the six stakes races. So we're going to start off with the fourth race. Race number four is the $50,000 Washington Cup Juvenile Phillies for two-year-old Phillies. They'll be sprinting six furlongs. You've got a field of eight signed on in this race. And the favorite, Bella Mia, number four at one to two. That's the morning line that Rob Rao gave number four, Bella Mia. And I'll tell you what, I think that's spot on because she's going to be very tough to beat this Sunday. Bella Mia, a daughter of the leading sire at Emerald Downs, Harbor the Gold. And Bella Mia, her last three wins have been outstanding. She broke her maiden on July 1st, came back two weeks later on July 16th, and won the Angie C stakes very impressively, and then came back on August 5th to win the Barbara Shinpo stakes by about five lengths. She wasn't really challenged on any three of those days. Her lone loss came in her career debut on June 11th. She actually sat off the pace. And to be honest with you, Bella Mia looked loaded turning for home that afternoon, but it was her first start. She was down inside, and she really didn't want to go through down inside and pass a runner to her outside. You can be forgiving of that effort. So if you toss out that race, you're left with three really, really nice efforts by Bella Mia. She's a speedy filly. She wants to be on the lead. When she stalked the pace, it wasn't that she didn't want to run by the other horses because it's a mental thing. I think that with her, she doesn't necessarily need the lead, but at the same time, if you take away her speed, you're taking away her best weapon. So I'd expect number four, Bella Mia, to be sent out of the gates to go to the lead. I think she can rate if she really needs to, because I know there are a couple of other very fast fillies in here, but I think Bella Mia at some point is going to have to take it to the front runners and the rest of the field, just like she did last time out when she eventually at the three eighths pole opened up in the Barbara Shinpo stakes and pretty much gave the field the slip right there. So number four, Bella Mia, the big favorite in the first leg of the all stakes pick four race number four. That's the Washington Cup juvenile fillies. I picked her on top. Now, if she wins... That is not an accomplishment to say that you picked her because she is going to be very low odds. And I think in this all stakes pick four, Bella Mia is probably going to be the single on a lot of tickets. If she is beaten on Sunday, well, we're looking at a pretty good payout in the pick four right there because you're going to have a lot of tickets eliminated if Bella Mia were to lose this fourth race on Sunday. Let's talk about a few of the other contenders that could try to pull off the upset and maybe do so. Number eight, Frisky Bear is the second morning line favorite all the way at nine to two from the Frank Lucarelli stable. It was interesting because this filly was in for a tag in her career debut on August 4th. The main $25,000 claiming level, she sprinted five furlongs got a perfect stocking trip off of two speedsters, ran by them when asked, and won drawing off, winning by three lengths. She actually went off as the favorite at eight to five that day. So there were horse players out there that figured that Frisky Bear could run a little bit, and she proved that those horse players were indeed correct. Now, interestingly, Frisky Bear, the runner who finished second in that race, a Philly can dream, came back to win by nine and a half lengths in her next start. So Frisky Bear obviously looks even better now seeing that a Philly can dream came back to romp the second place finisher in Frisky Bear's maiden score. Frisky Bear could improve second time out. I mean, you look at horses, sometimes they give get a race and then they come back and they run even better. And that's the situation there with Frisky Bear. I think she's going to get a really good stocking trip in this race. A Philly can dream. She's also in this race. We're going to talk about her in just a minute, but Frisky Bear will be sitting off of both Bella Mia and a Philly Can Dream. Maybe if those two get reckless out on the lead and they get tired, Frisky Bear can come and mow them down late, especially if she improves in her second lifetime start. I would consider you 
using Frisky Bear if you were not to single Bellamia on your tickets in the All Stakes Pick 4. Number 6, a filly can dream, of course, finishing second to Frisky Bear, so she'll need to turn the tables on that runner. But a filly can dream comes off a win herself on August 18th. That was one week ago, folks. Actually, nine days to be exact. And you never really know how they're going to rebound after such short rest. But I'll tell you this, a Philly can dream looked awfully impressive in her last start. She went to the lead, got a beautiful break. I mean, she rocketed out of the gate, went to the lead, opened up down the lane. She was on the wrong lead. That's the only knock I can give her in that race. And she won by nine and a half lengths. She didn't beat the greatest field either. Now she's facing tougher. She's also a candidate to bounce. The bounce theory basically stating, hey, you have a horse that runs a really, really big race. Sometimes they're career best and then they come back in a few weeks and they regress significantly I think that's the situation with a Philly can dream she's going to have pace pressure from Bella Mia she's facing much tougher and I think number six a Philly can dream is a bet against number five Faith Flies again is still a maiden she's actually finished behind number four Bella Mia two consecutive times however last time out she ran fourth behind Bella Mia and ran pretty poorly I think the ceiling with her is probably an exotics placing for number five, Faith Flies Again. Number three, Goose Prairie, another one probably best used in exotics. It's interesting because she's run well twice. She's another maiden. She finished second on July 23rd and came back a few weeks later on August 12th and finished second again, although she got a much higher speed figure in her second lifetime start, so she improved, that being number three, Goose Prairie. Maybe she can take another step forward in her third career start and hit the board at a little bit of a price. She She's bred to be pretty nice. She's out of Kaching, a mare who has produced nine winners from ten babies, and two of those siblings of Goose Prairie were stakes winners sprinting. Follow the light and cabrage. So Goose Prairie, the bottom side says she's going to be a pretty nice little sprinter, and she started off her career with two solid efforts, but she needs to improve significantly if she wants to win race four. That's the $50,000 Washington Cup Juvenile Phillies. My top pick in there is number four, Bella Mia. If I were to make an all-stakes pick four ticket, I'd probably single her because she's going to be very tough if she runs her race. Race number five up next. It begins the 20 cent pick seven this Sunday. It's the $50,000 Washington Cup Juvenile for two year old Colts and Gelding sprinting six furlongs. So we just talked about the Philly division. Now we're going to talk about the boys. This time I actually have a little bit of an interesting pick. Bella Mia, a lot of people are going to pick her. Not an accomplishment if she wins for me. That's pretty much a free space if she wins for a lot of folks in the all stakes pick four. I'm taking a little bit of a price here in race five, though. That is the Washington Cup Juvenile. And I'm going to the rail. Number one, Boundary Bay for trainer Mike Puich, although he's more of a paper trainer because Glenn Todd has been conditioning this horse up at Hastings. He's also known in the ownership ranks as North American Thoroughbred Racing Corporation and Glenn Todd shipping him to Mike Puich's stable to run in the Washington Cup this week. Now, Boundary Bay, he's bred to be a good one. He's a full brother to Obi Harbor, the horse of the meet last year, and obviously those who follow Emerald Downs and the Pacific Northwest Racing know that Boundary Bay, or rather Obi Harbor, was a very, very talented horse. Now, talking about Boundary Bay, last time out he ran second behind Stablemate. He's the reason, and he's the reason is the best two-year-old up at Hastings, so... He's the reason, actually, Boundary Bay is stable, mate. Boundary Bay ran a pretty good race that day. He's cutting back in distance today from six and a half furlongs last time out to this six furlong distance, so we know he's going to be fit. I'm going to tell you this. I hate the rail post position in sprints. Number one, Boundary Bay drawing the rail. I don't necessarily like that part, but what that tells me is I think that jockey David Lopez, who's riding this horse, is going to be very aggressive out of the gate and put Boundary Bay on the lead, and I'm going to say that maybe Boundary Bay will try to steal this race, and I'm hoping that he does because he's my top pick. He's 6-1 to one on the morning line. He broke his maiden going wire to wire at Hastings on May 28th and then came back to lose by a neck to he's the reason and then he was beaten by he's the reason again in his third start so boundary bay has had three starts but in two of those three races boundary bay went to the lead i wouldn't worry about fractional times you look 23 and 2 and 22 and 4 those were the fractions he set up at hastings when he went to the lead but the hastings racetrack produces a little bit of slower times than here at emerald downs so 
I'm convinced that Boundary Bay has enough sprint speed to get to the lead in this race. There's a lot of tactical speed in this race, but there is no confirmed front runner. A lot of horses who like to be close to the pace, but don't necessarily need to be on the lead. So Boundary Bay, I'm betting he's going to steal this one at a pretty good price. I like that David Lopez has enough confidence in this young horse to come down to Washington State and ride him. So Boundary Bay, 6-1. to one. One to consider here in the Washington Cup Juvenile. Others to consider include Sip and Fire, who's the morning line favorite at 5-2. to two. Now, Sip and Fire, another horse bred to be pretty nice. He's a half to two Washington State champions, Del Rio Harbor, and could have been the whiskey. Last time out, an interesting scenario with Sip and Fire. August 6th was the WTBOA Lad Stakes. He sat off the pace. He stalked. He got a perfect trip until the eighth pole. He was making a move between horses. Elliott Bay, the eventual winner of the race, ducked in just a little bit. Sip and Fire had to check off heels pretty severely. Now, Sip and Fire, obviously, when you take back like that, you lose a little bit of momentum, and he lost momentum. Would he have won the race? Hard to say. It really is, because I took a look at the replay the other day, and one thing I noticed about Sip and Fire was after he took up, Rocco Bowen was riding him. He tried to keep him going, obviously, but... He wanted it to move inside of Elliott Bay, and Sip and Fire didn't make up any sort of ground. After checking, he was about a length and a half behind Elliott Bay, and he had a final furlong to at least make up some ground on Elliott Bay, and he never really made up any ground. I don't know if he would have won that race. I think he would have been closer if he did not steady, but the thing is, he had so much time to make up just a little bit of ground just to show us that he had some run there, and he wasn't able to do so. I think Sip and Fire is a play against on the win end. His first race was outstanding when he broke his maiden. Second time out, he bounced pretty badly in the Emerald Express, and then he came back last time out and ran second with a troubled trip. Now, Sip and Fire, I think if he gets a good trip, he's going to be right there at the finish. He's classy enough. Rocco Bowen rides him again. He's learned from that experience because that was the first time Rocco was aboard, so now he's got a race under his belt with Sip and Fire. And Sip and Fire is my second pick. I still think he's going to be very competitive in this race, but I made him my second pick here in the Washington Cup Juvenile. Number six, Elliott Bay, of course, the winner of the WTBOA Lad Stakes. He likes to be close to the pace, so I'd expect Elliott Bay to put pressure on number one, Boundary Bay. Elliott Bay was a maiden heading into the WTBOA Lad Stakes. He went off at 7-1 to anyway, and he won the race by three quarters of a length. He drifted in at the eighth pole. He's still green. He's got plenty of room to improve. That said... I think that he's a horse who could bounce in this race after such a big effort, such an improvement in his third lifetime start. And Elliott Bay is a play against on the win end for me as well, although I made him my third pick. I think he's probably going to be good enough. If he is as good as his connections think he is, I think he's good enough to hit the board here. But I think he's a play against in terms of uh, winning. And I also think that he could bounce a little bit and regress off that big effort. Number four, Brown Tiger, 7-2 to on the morning line. He comes off of three pretty nice efforts. All three career races were good, but he has yet to win any of those races. He finished behind Sip and Fire. He lost by a head in his career debut. He came back to run third in the next two stakes races for two-year-olds here, the Emerald Express and the WTBOA Lad Stakes. Never was really a factor to threaten either of those races, although it's interesting because Brown Tiger went off favored last time out. He was 9-5. to five. He was tugging at his rider pretty good. I noticed that throughout the backstretch in the far turn run he really wanted to go if he can relax a little bit more I think he'll have more left in the tank but it's interesting that Julian Couton who was aboard number four Brown Tiger in his all three career starts is now on number nine Trumpets who won for maiden $25,000 on July 29th I don't know what to make of that but I don't think that's necessarily a positive sign that could be a trainer or an owner switch you never know but um It is worth noting that Julian has written Brown Tiger, and he he now is on number nine, Trumpets, in this fifth race. Trumpets, a horse who is getting some support on the morning line at six to one. So Rob Rao, the morning line maker, thinks Trumpets is going to get support, and he also thinks this horse probably has a little bit of a chance. This horse broke his maiden in lifetime start number three, sprinting five furlongs. The winner that day, the second-place finisher, Cody's Choice, he was on the lead. 
he really didn't have much finish down the lane and trumpets ran by him was all out to win the race and i think he's going to need to improve to be competitive in this spot but he comes from leading trainer blaine wright stable number nine trumpets has a right to improve after that win sometimes the light bulb turns on there after they break their maiden my top pick though in race five the fifty thousand dollar washington cup juvenile is number one boundary bay at six to one he draws the rail Race number six begins the one dollar one two three racing wager, and it's the third Washington Cup stakes race, the fifty thousand dollar Washington Cup sophomore Philly stake. Now, the first thing I did when I looked at this race is went through every horse in their breeding because this race is for three year olds going one mile. There's a few runners in here that don't have much route experience. A few of them haven't not even routed before. And the morning line favorite is number one, Gazing. And let's just talk about her because we're going to talk about this whole field, a field of seven, very competitive. And Gazing is a filly who finished second to Little Dancer a few starts ago. Little Dancer has since come back to win the Washington Oaks and finished second in the Emerald Distaff against older fillies and mares, which is really impressive. Also, Gazing finished uh, in front of Daddy Always Says, who was third in the Washington Oaks. And Daddy always says a well-regarded runner from the K. Cooper stable. So Gazing has run very well against some really nice runners. Here's the catch, though. All career races for Gazing, all four starts, including those nice efforts with Little Dancer and Daddy always says were in sprint races. And you look at Gazing's pedigree, breeding on the bottom side for Gazing, very, very sprinty. Her dam is named Light My Ducks. And Light My Ducks ran three times in route races in her career, and all three races were very poor. She did not want to go a route of ground. And really, you look at Light My Ducks' produce, essentially the siblings to gazing, and you'll find that her only baby to run a route of ground also ran very poorly. So that's worth considering. Gazing's bottom side says she's a sprinter. Harbor the Golds can go uh, a route of ground. Mach 1 rules right there off the bat. So if Gazing can get this distance in the pedigree, it's because of her top side, Harbor the Gold, not on her bottom side like my ducks. I think because of her breeding, uh, she's a play against on the win end. At 5-2 to two on the morning line, I am playing against Gazing. In fact, I'm not going to put her on the all-stakes pick four ticket. I think you have to spread in the all-stakes pick four in race number six, go three or four deep. The same can be said in the race five, the $50,000 Washington Cup Juvenile, where you single number four, Bellamia, in race four. But Gazing is not one of the runners that I would use on the all stake pick four ticket for that reason. I think she's more of a sprinter. I think she'll like sprinting a little more. All four career races were very good. She either won or finished second. Terry Gillahan claimed this filly for $15,000 in her debut, and it turned out to be a very, very good claim. But we'll see if Gazing wants a mile. I think she's beatable going a route of ground. Really, there are other runners in here that have gone a route of ground. And one of those runners is no talking back. Call me crazy, number three. No talking back. I like her a lot, and I picked her on top. And you can call me crazy because she's still a maiden. She has yet to win, but I really like her in this spot. Her breeding screams two turns. She's by Flatter out of the lawyer Ron Mare. Talk to my lawyer who won the Gottstein Futurity a few years back. That's a mile and a 16th two-year-old race. No talking back, a three-year-old now. She's only routed once in her career. Last time out on July 29th, she only lost by a head to number four. I double dare you, who's also signed on here. I think No Talking Back could have won that race. She had to steady on the far turn. She tried to get through on the inside, was a little intimidated to go through on the rail. Eventually made up ground in the final hundred yards or so and lost the head bob, lost by a head. I think No Talking Back should have won the race. Gets a rider upgrade to Javier Matias. And No Talking Back will also probably be sitting off a pretty fast pace in this race. It looks like a number of stretch-out sprinters are going to head and be forwardly placed, so I'd expect no talking back to sit off of them, and it could bode well for her. No talking back from the Chris Densley stable. Bred all over to like going a route of ground, and I also like the second-time routing angle, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes runners route, and then their second career route effort they run much much better and that could be the case with number three no talking back the same can be said for number four i double dare you who lost by a half length to a really nicely bred horse and racy rascal and i double dare you's career debut that was a sprint race she came back three weeks later 
and routed in her second lifetime start, and she won by a head. She was a little green, a little bit tired in the final 16th of a mile, was on the wrong lead at one point, but she held off no talking back, number three, who came with a nice surge. Here's another situation. I Double Dare You couldn't prove in her second route try in her third career race. I Double Dare You's damn Kirkella is by Giants Causeway. So right there, the bottom side of I Double Dare You says she will love going route. And also, I Double Dare You's damn Kirkella only ran a route of ground once in her life, and she won. So I Double Dare You, thinking she can improve in her second career route race. Her first start against winners, but it looks like she can be competitive in this spot. This is a competitive race, but in terms of class, it hasn't come up as classy this year as it has in past years. Number seven, Retreat Yourself is 3-1 to one on the morning line. Look at her only route race, ladies and gentlemen. June 25th in the Irish Day Stakes against Open Company. She finished third behind two of the best three-year-old fillies here at Emerald Downs. Top quality and blazing beauty. Little Dancer didn't run well that day, and she came back to run extremely well in her next two races. But top quality and blazing beauty, probably the second and third best three-year-old fillies here on the grounds. And Retreat Yourself finished third behind them. She ran really, really well. She takes a couple of months off, only has two works in a span of about eight or nine weeks. And she comes back against older fillies and mares in the King County Stakes on Long Acres Mile Day and runs very poorly. I think based on the break and just how many works she had, which wasn't many, she might have needed that race to get back into race shape. This time around, she's stretching back out. I really like that after such a poor effort in the King County where she lost by 11 lengths, she comes back just eight mornings later and works a nice easy half mile in 48 and three. That tells me that she came out of the race okay. Doris Harwood has done so well over the years at Emerald Down. She's won a lot of stakes races too. And she obviously knows how to train a good racehorse. And obviously Doris said she is fine coming out of that race to enter retreat yourself back in here. Retreat yourself three to one on the morning line. And I think that she will be very tough if she could duplicate the Irish Day Stakes run where she ran third. I made her my second pick behind number three, No Talking Back. Retreat Yourself certainly has the class over number three, No Talking Back, but I'm taking a shot with No Talking Back on top. Retreat Yourself would be hard for me not to use on any sort of tickets, whether it be pick four tickets, exotic wagers, I think Retreat Yourself is going to be a major player in here. Number two, Grace Bay is a filly that took nine times to break her mane. She finally got the job done on August 20th. That was seven days ago, folks. Grace Bay wheels back in a week. We talked about this with a filly can dream in the first Washington Cup race. You never really know how these runners are going to come back off a week rest. It's a very short period of time to rest and a very short period of time between races. But Grace Bay put it all together last time out, going six furlong, stretching out back to a mile. This is her second time going a route of ground. Two starts ago, she ran in the race in which I double dare you and no talking back finished 1-2. Grace Bay finished third that afternoon. So Grace Bay needs to turn the tables on those two runners and also beat... Some other nice fillies like Retreat Yourself and also Gazing, if Gazing happens to get the mile distance. Grace Bay, 4-1 to one for the Frank Lucarelli camp. The other two runners we have not mentioned, number five, Miss Winetopper. The last time she won two starts ago, she won a $10,000 claimer. I don't think she has the class to be competitive in this race. Number six, Targa, another one where class is a big question. Last time out, she went gate to wire and a $15,000 claimer. Now she's in against legit... Phillies and mares, ones who want a route. Now, it's interesting because Targa, you watch her run. She's very, very speedy. She looks like a sprint filly, but the bottom side of her pedigree says she'll probably be okay going a route of ground because Targa's dam ran third in the mile and an eighth Washington Oaks and finished second in the one mile Boeing stakes back in the day. So Targa's bottom side says that she'll be okay going longer. She's very quick, stretching out to two turns. She will be on the lead, and she'll try to take this field as far as she can. I think gazing number one is probably going to be close to the pace this afternoon. Maybe number four, I double dare you. But my top pick is number three, no talking back. Off the fast pace, number seven, retreat yourself, my second pick. And then number four, I double dare you is my third selection. So we went three, seven, four. And race number six, the Washington. Cup sophomore Philly stakes. Race number seven, the boy version of that race. It's the Washington Cup sophomore stakes. 
This race, race seven, begins the 50 cent pick five. Remember, folks, the pick five wager is a 15% takeout wager. The pick seven, which begins all the way back in race number five, that's also a 15% takeout wager. So, horse players, we know you love low takeout. So why not play on Washington Cup Day while you go to the beer festival? Anyway, heading back to the field here for race seven, you've got a field of seven signed on here. Three-year-old Colts and Geldings, the morning line favorite at three to one. We go to the outside, number seven, Buckley Bay. He's actually my top pick in this race, and I think that he could wire this field. The only horse that has the speed to go out with him is number six, Attaboy Dougie from the K. Cooper stable, although I talked to assistant trainer Bryson Cooper, who said he believes this horse can rate. Buckley Bay wants to be on the lead. He's very, very quick. You look at his breeding. He's by Harbor the Gold out of a tribunal mare. That does not scream route pedigree, but at the same time, two of Buckley Bay's siblings have won routing, including Caribou Road, who ran second in the Coca-Cola stakes going out of ground a few years ago. So it looks like he probably will be okay When you look at the pedigree going to turns, he's going to go to the lead. He's very, very quick. In his first start, he actually broke his maiden for $25,000. Dueled in an insanely fast clip, 21 and 4 and 44 and 2, and just kept on rolling one by two lengths. It was very impressive. And the second place finisher, Boo Boo Bear, has since come back to win one in a romp in his next start. And he's in a nice allowance race earlier on in the card on Sunday. Buckley Bay coming from the Tom Wenzel stable. Rocco Bowen aboard. He's Tom's main rider. Rocco Bowen riding for the first time. I think Buckley Bay is just going to go to the lead and take it to him. And my guess is that he could take this field gate to wire, and I'm betting that he will because he's my top pick. Others to consider include number three, Pulpit's Power, making his first start for the Blaine Wright stable. Now, Pulpit's Power was claimed for $15,000 in his last start. He came from the back of the field, only lost by three quarters of a length. But he ran arguably the best race, and he might have been the best horse because he broke very awkwardly that day. It says broke awkward in the comment lines, and I remember he did not have a good break. It definitely cost him at least three quarters of a length, and Pulpit's Power might have won that race. However, now he's facing Stakes Company. He's going a route of ground, and you look at Pulpit's Power's pedigree. This horse is never routed. The sire never did much as a racehorse, his sire being War Power. His dam, Parker's Jewel, never raced. And the dam sire, Parker's Stormcat, was a sprinter. He sprinted on the turf. So you look and you say to yourself, well, the bottom side of the pedigree says Pulpit's Power is a sprinter. The top half, out of a Pulpit Stallion, well, maybe War Power can produce some routers because Pulpit has, I should say he's by a pulpit sire, not out of, out of his dam, by his sire. But anyway, pulpit's power, the only time he's won was at the main $15,000 level on June 3rd. It was a state-bred race. Blaine Wright wins at a 31% clip first off the claim, so he might be able to improve this horse, and it wouldn't surprise me if he claimed this horse for the reason of to run this horse in this race. Similarly to what we found in the Philly version of this race, the Washington Cup sophomore Philly stakes, race number seven, the Washington Cup sophomore stakes, did not come up tough in terms of class. We've seen a lot more classier horses in this race over the years. But Pulpit's power still looks like a runner that probably needs to improve if he wants to win the race. But hey, maybe he likes routing. We'll see. I made him my third pick because I think Blaine Wright can improve this horse. I trust Blaine Wright's instincts. He's a terrific trainer. He does a lot of good here at Emerald Downs. He's winning at a 34% clip. He does really well wherever he goes, whether it be here at Golden Gate Fields. And he knows how to pick out a good horse when he sees one. So Pulpit's power one to consider. Keller's gold is interesting because this horse has the class to win this race. The only time he routed, he ran second at 1-9 to nine at Portland Meadows in the Columbia River Stakes. He got a 43 buyer that day. That's one of his lowest buyer speed figures. And one thing that's interesting, he was claimed out of his last race where he won by a length at six furlongs at the $20,000 claiming level on June 23rd. Since then, he has come back to work one time on August 5th. That was three weeks ago. So this horse is barely worked out in the mornings, has time off. I'm playing against. I wonder if this horse is going to be fit enough to route and run a big race in this spot. Number four, double A prospect. He's the last one we'll talk about. Seven to two on the morning line. 
Let's talk about his breeding because he's never gone around of ground before. He's by a barrage out of a conquistador cielo mare named Persephone. Now, a barrage has produced a lot of sprinters. Persephone has had four babies that have routed in their careers, and two of them have won, so that's a good thing. But the main, main part of the breeding that says double-A prospect will go a route of ground is that he is out of a conquistador cielo mare. Persephone is by Conquistador Cielo. And you know what Conquistador Cielo did? He won the Belmont Stakes at a mile and a half, folks. So the bottom side says Double A Prospect is going to be just fine going a route of ground. You look at his past performances, he's really put it together in his past two races. He went to the lead in many of his races early on in his career. His first two races, he sat dead last. His third and fourth starts, he went to the lead, and he ended up running much better. Broke his maiden at the maiden special weight level on May 14th, 2017 by six and a quarter lengths. Since then, he has come back and shown new dimensions, including sitting off the pace and actually running on like last time out, where he stalked the pace going six furlongs. He crossed the wire first, but was disqualified for interference at the start of the race. He ducked in at the start of the race and caused a chain reaction. The stewards disqualified him, but double-A prospect ran a really good race that day. I made him my second pick. I think Tom Wenzel's got a strong one-two punch in here. I think double-A prospect will like going her out of ground, and it seems like he's get her, getting better with racing experience so number four double a prospect my second pick we use number seven buckley bay number four double a prospect and number three pulpits power seven four three my top three picks in the washington cup sophomore stakes race number eight the second to last washington cup stakes race we're going to talk about here and this is the washington cup philly and mare stakes a fifty thousand dollar event they'll be going one mile and a sixteenth just like the first Washington Cup Stakes race, we've got a big favorite here, number three, Citizen Kitty. And you look at the other runners in here and you say to yourself, if Citizen Kitty shows up with her C race, she will probably win this race. I mean, she is much, much classier than the other five runners in here. Citizen Kitty has really gotten good this year. She's very versatile. She's won stakes from six and a half furlongs all the way to a mile and an eighth, like last time out in the Emerald Distaff, where she won by a length and a half. And then on July 16th, she won the Boeing stakes going a mile by four and a half lengths. She's cutting back a 16th of a mile. This race is a mile and a 16th race. Citizen Kitty might regress, might bounce a little bit just off a two-week break. That said, like I said earlier... All she has to do is run her C race, and she's probably good enough to win this. Citizen Kitty, we're just going to say she's a single here in this eighth race, which begins the pick five wager, a 15% takeout wager. Remember that. Or rather, the uh, late pick four, I should say. That's race number eight. Citizen Kitty, my top pick at two to five. Number six, X at 60 Slew, the second choice at nine to two was claimed by trainer Blaine Wright three starts ago and has since come back to finish third in an ice allowance sprint and then came back to win at the $20,000 claiming level. It was a state bread race for Washington bread, $20,000 claiming fillies and mares. Exit 60 slew now routing. Three starts ago, she routed and won by a head, beat McDove that day. McDove realistically is probably a $15,000 claimer, maybe a $20,000 claimer on her very best day. So Exit 60 slew will need to improve to beat number three, Citizen Kitty, but she's good enough to defeat the other runners for second. My Heart Goes On comes off a nice third place finish. She only lost by a neck in the six and a half furlong King County Stakes. Sat off the pace. She likes to be close to the pace usually, but this time around she sat dead last, came with a huge run, and only lost by a neck. I'd expect her to be forwardly placed, stretching back out to a mile. She won the Washington Cup three-year-old Philly Stake last year going a mile, and she won by a length scoring a gate-to-wire victory. So my heart goes on, has proven she can go a mile and be competitive. This is a mile and a 16th. Lionel Camacho Flores hopping aboard. Two Frank Lucarelli runners in here, both owned by Darren Paul. Sugar Seeker, number five, and number one, Dreamer S. Sugar Seeker won the last time she routed. That said, she only won by a nose 
and defeated $10,000 claiming competition. Number one, Dreamer S is also one going her out of ground before. That was back in September of 2016. She won by a half length. She hasn't been seen routing since then, but we know that both Frank Lucarelli entrants have been successful going her out of ground. So maybe you want to take a look at them to complete the exotic wagers at a price. Dreamer S number one is 10 to 1, and Sugar Seeker number five is 12 to 1. Race number nine. This is the final race we're going to be talking about. It's the Muckleshoot Tribal Classic for older Washington breads. And the favorite, Mach 1 Rules, number four, four to five on the morning line. This horse has been terrific against the best older horses on the grounds. And two weeks ago, he ran in the Long Acres Mile and finished second behind Gold Rush Dancer. He certainly did not disgrace in that effort. Ran a really solid race. Had to work hard to run by Dedicated to You, the third place finisher in the Long Acres Mile. He's number five in this race. I think Mach 1 Rules is going to be tough again in this spot. Mach 1 Rules before his second place finish in the Long Acres Mile. Won the Mount Rainier Stakes going a mile and a 16th this distance and also won the Budweiser Stakes over Nice Sprinter's Prime Engine to Grandma's House We Go and Barclay. I think Mach 1 Rules is going to get a perfect stocking trip in this race. Off number five, dedicated to you, and number two, Mike Mann's Gold. Both runners who are projected to be on the lead in this spot. That'll set things up nicely for Mach 1 Rules, who probably will be sitting just off of them. Number two, Mike Mann's Gold is the second choice on the morning line at 9 to 5. He's won four straight races this year. His lone route try in that quartet of races was two starts ago at the $20,000 claiming level, and he won by a length and three quarters very, very, very easily. So the margin does not indicate how much the best he was. He was much the best in that route try. That was against easier competition. Now he's facing a couple really nice horses like Mach 1 Rules and Dedicated to You. Mike Mann's gold beat Remember to Breathe in that route try. And Remember to Breathe since then has come back to win and win strongly. So Mike Mann's gold at least beat a pretty solid claimer there in Remember to Breathe. If Dedicated to You was not in this race, I would probably pick Mike Mann's Gold because it looks like he would have been the lone speed. But Dedicated to You will be pressuring Mike Mann's Gold on the front end. I think Mike Mann's Gold's going to run another good race. I made it my second pick behind Mach 1 Rules. Number 5, Dedicated to You. Hadn't really run a step in his two starts this year. He put it all together, though, in the Long Acres Mile in his third start in his form cycle in 2017. He was 82-1 to one and ran third in the Long Acres Mile. Set the pace, got pressure, kept grinding along, and was in the battle for second with Mach 1 rules. We talked about the bounce theory a few races ago. Dedicated to you as a typical bounce candidate. This horse ran huge last time out, and it's going to be very hard to duplicate that effort. He's facing easier with the exception of Mach 1 rules, But he's going to have company from Mike Mann's gold out on the lead. And I think dedicated to use a play against on the win end. But he could hit the board. He's only going to beat two other horses to finish third. The press at 12-1 to on the morning line. He hasn't been the same horse since winning the Washington Cup three-year-old stakes last year. Over number four, Mach 1 rules. So the press has actually defeated Mach 1 rules before. But he hasn't shown a lot of gas this year. And I think the press is going to need to improve significantly to hit the board. Number three, hit the beach. He's the last runner in the Muckleshoot Tribal Classic. 15-1 to on the morning line. He's by Harbor the Gold out of Hit a Star. Now, Hit the Beach's siblings were both sprinters. Hit the Beach has never gone a route of ground before. And he'll probably be, well, to be honest with you, he'll probably be the longest shot in the field, and he'll have to really, really pick it up if he wants to make an impact in this spot. Number four, Mach 1 rules my top pick in the Muckleshoot Tribal Classic this year. So turning back to the six stakes races, we're going to go over the picks really quickly. Bella Mia, race four, she's my pick in the $50,000 Washington Cup Juvenile Phillies. I would single her on the all-stakes pick four ticket. Race number five, the $50,000 Washington Cup Juvenile. We took number one, Boundary Bay. I think you can spread in that race. I would go probably number one, Boundary Bay. I'd also include number five, Sippin' Fire on the ticket, number six, Elliott Bay on the ticket, and number four, Brown Tiger on my all-stakes pick four ticket. Race number six is the $50,000 Washington Cup sophomore Philly stake. Number three, no talking back, five to one on the morning line. I put her on top. She's bred to love going her out of ground. I'd use her on the ticket as well as number seven, retreat yourself. And number one, I double dare you. Number four, 
So right now we're going one by four by three. And then we turn our attention to race seven, the $50,000 Washington Cup sophomore stakes. I'd use number seven, Buckley Bay, on the ticket, as well as number four, Double A Prospect, the two Tom Wenzel runners. So you're looking at a $12 ticket, one by four by three by two. In my all stakes pick four, we went four, one, five, six, four, then three, seven, four, and finally seven, four, number seven, Buckley Bay, my top pick in race seven, the sophomore stakes, and number four, double A prospect, my second pick. Race number eight, that is the race for older fillies and mares. We went with the Citizen Kitty, number three, and then in race nine, Mach 1 rules, number four. That does it for the analysis for Washington Cup Day, Sunday, August 27th. Remember that beer festival coming Emerald Downs this Sunday in the park area. You don't want to miss it. Great racing, great fun. Until then, good luck with your wagers. Keep living the dream, folks.